Robert Plank Show, episode 332, self-publishing, book marketing, ghostwriting, and LinkedIn marketing with the writing king, Richard Lowe Jr. Hey everyone, and welcome back to the show. We're talking right now with Richard Lowe Jr., and he's a best-selling author who has published 63 books, ghostwritten 12 books, and produced several hundred articles for blogs and publications. He is the owner and senior writer of The Writing King, which provides services such as ghostwriting, book coaching, WordPress, WordPress implementation, blogging, and copywriting. Richard is also a senior LinkedIn branding specialist and has written over 150 LinkedIn profiles. So, Mr. Richard, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Awesome. I'm glad that you are here. And so we, we heard a little bit about you. And so, you know, having uh, having read or heard that, uh, what are you up to these days? What had you excited? Well, I just finished a book coaching project with a man in France. He's the senior vice president of a major Fortune 50 company. And he's releasing a book in a couple of weeks called Digitize or Die. And it's about the Internet of Things and the effect that it's having on companies. You're seeing the effect right now with companies like Sears and Kmart going down the tubes. And this book explains why if you don't want to have that same fate happen to you and you're a big company, you better read it and find out what's going on. So I coached that, coached him through as a writing coach how to I'm writing the book. And he, of course, was the technical guy. And that was very exciting. And... Um, Working on a lot of blogging projects. I just published a book on human rights, a coloring book for children. That was a fun project. And, you know, the usual writing blogs and stuff that people pay me to do and things like that. Awesome. So it sounds like firing on all cylinders and, and uh, having lots of, of fun projects. So so you say that you were a, a writing coach uh, for this guy's book for this Digitize or Die. And so, I mean, what, what does that mean exactly? Like, what's your role in that sort of project as a writing coach? Well... He, I work with him um, to provide the writing expertise. First of all, he's French. He's not a Native American speaker. So it's kind of French-American. And I helped with the, the language itself and proofreading and stuff. And then putting together the structure of the chapters and how the book was supposed to read and then reviewing it over and over and over again to get it right and then coaching him on how to cite the various sources and that you actually have to cite sources and checking for things like that, how to look up things on the internet. It's basically a long involved process. It's a little bit easier than ghostwriting where ghostwriting, I take it all myself and write it myself. He did, he did most of the writing himself and I just helped him with it. Does okay. that make sense? Yeah, it, it does. And so, so as far as like uh, how your, your time is split up, so is it safe to say that it's sort of split up between like there, there are times where you ghostwrite, sometimes where you do the writing for yourself, and then there's other times when uh, you're just sort of the coach and sort of moving them along? Is that about like accurate as far as how things are split up? Uh, more or less, more or less. I do a lot of um, guest blogging, which is where I write blogs for other articles for other blogs and websites and so I do have some time there I do a lot of promotion I do a lot of promotion on a site called Harrow which is help a reporter out because that gives quotes and links to my site and creates backlinks and then I do the ghostwriting copywriting and the LinkedIn profiles is a big part of what I do um, help people with their LinkedIn and get it working right so that it actually gets them leads that are qualified well, cool. So, uh, as far as all these things, so there's the there's the guest blogging, there's the book stuff, there's the LinkedIn profiles, uh, and, and all that fun stuff. And so, sort of, what what's your schedule laid out like? Like, do you say, well, I'm going to do each thing uh, an hour a day, or is it like one thing's on Monday, one thing's on Tuesday, or is it just like wherever it falls, or what's sort of that schedule like? Well, at the beginning of each week, I try and map out a schedule for the whole week. Of course, it lasts until the beginning of the first day. You know, <laughs> all plans are good until they start being executed. Uh, that, was, that was an old military thing, I guess. Um, and, then, and then I work from there. So each morning I get up and I plan the day. So I say, okay, I got these things to get done today. These are my deadlines or th these things to get done this week. So I block out four hours or eight hours or two hours or whatever I think it's going to take. And I leave a little slack in there because, you know, things always take a little longer sometimes than they're expected to. And I use um, a method where I write for 15 minutes and then get up out of my chair for excuse me, I write for 45 minutes and then get up out of my chair for 15 because um, writers spend all day on their butt. That's pretty normal and you have to get up or 
you know, get back problems and things like that. And do a little physical work, walk around the block or go look at the birds or something like that. Great. And, and I kind of do a similar sort of thing. Like if I, if I do like a, a lot of like either like blogging or videos or programming or whatever it is, then I, I kind of like, I used to tell myself I didn't need that break or I'd go from like the computer to go and watching TV and come back and didn't really feel re refreshed and recharged. And definitely like going outside and getting that fresh air and hearing the birds tweet and all that fun stuff, I can definitely uh, relate to that. And so, um, so when, when you're, you know, doing all this, the writing stuff and you're blocking out your time, uh, do you ever have those times when you just kind of can't get started? You kind of can't get past the, the writer's block and the blank page and all that fun stuff? It happens. It doesn't happen as often as it used to, and it doesn't happen as often as it does with other writers. One of the reasons is I have so many projects where if I feel blocked on one, I just go work on something else. And I've got such a varied background that that works very well. And then if I'm just blocked from writing, it usually means I need to get up and get outside for an hour, walk around because I get what I call square eyes staring at the computer screen and and it just, that alone causes the mind to block. The other thing that can cause writer's block is somebody might make a covertly negative comment about something and that can just stick in the back of the mind. It has to be covert. If it's overt, you see it. But if it's covert, then you don't see it and it kind of gets in the way and you kind of have to st think for a minute and go, oh, yeah, yeah, that person said that. Okay. And that clears up the writer's block right away. So could you sort of give me an example of what you were just talking about so we can understand? Yeah. If you um, – talking to somebody about the writing, they, they might have read the book as a beta reader. That's where you read through it before it's published. And they didn't return any comments at all, or their comment was, oh, it was okay. Or you ask them a question about the book, and they, <sighs> a deep sigh, well, if, you know, I, I like most of it except for this part, you know. Um, wh where the comment comes across more or less as seemingly lukewarm positive, but really it's like, I guess you could call it a backhanded compliment, where it seems like a compliment, but it really isn't. Um that the book is great except for this character or but it's not it's not um helpful it's very general that's the problem with i, I wrote a book on on how to how to make a living as a self-published author it's my one of my newest books and it goes into this a lot where criticism and critique are different criticism is this particular character is not poorly constructed and here's why and here's what you can do to fix it whereas cri criticism that's critique whereas criticism is yeah your characters all suck and it's very general and there's nothing you can do about it you, you don't have anything to pin pin it on so it kind of just drops you down to kind of despair because you don't know what's wrong and that's where the the covertness comes in it's not it's not specific but it is intended to be malicious Okay. Um, sometimes, sometimes on Amazon, I'll get a I'll get a review that just says the book sucked. It's like, and, and a one star review. It's like, well, what sucked about it? You know, I mean, no, virtually no books worth a one star review. That means you know, you, it, it's not even worth the paper it's printed on. And all authors get that. And and what's that mean? You know. Right, Why did right. you like it? Right. It's it's like if they're that vague about it, it's like there's no there's no specific thing that you can go back and improve. It's just like just this is like kind of hurtful, kind of almost insult that sort of sits with you. And I, I can definitely relate to that. Like if uh, if someone says, "Well, this isn't even worth the ninety nine cents," and I'm thinking like you couldn't find one thing in there, or like when they uh when they get the book for free when you're doing a, a promotion or something like that, or when they they'll like pick out like one page of that of the whole book and they'll say, "Well, I didn't like this topic and this topic," and I'm thinking. And, well, all those things they listed were all on like page 15. They ignored the rest of the book and just focused on like all the things they didn't like on that one page. And so I, I can definitely relate to a lot of uh, a, a lot of that sort of hurtful stuff. And so, I mean, is, is there a, a solution to that other than just like thinking your way out of it? Well, the solution is 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 kind of what my dad used to tell me when the kids would pick on me at school. It's like grow up. You know, it happens. There are people who are malicious out there in the world, and that's malicious because it's not useful to the – that kind of review is not useful to the reader, and it's not useful to the writer. 
It's not useful to anyone. It's just somebody would just vented. And you just got to ignore malicious people. They have no value. Not they have no value. Their comments have no value. Um, and they're, you, the problem is spotting it that it had an effect on you that, oh yeah, okay, that was that negative comment. The review that they left was, this book is suitable for charcoal. That was the comment that caused me to think that I'm not a good writer and that's what caused me to stop today and not be able to write for an hour. Okay, I got it. And then I'm fine. Okay, so, so it, so it but, sounds like the answer is sort of the, to, to put that in the correct box, right? Like categorize like the helpful versus the unhelpful stuff. And I can definitely relate to that in a lot of ways. It's sort of like, you know, if you're driving your car down the street and someone cuts you off in traffic, are you really going to let that ruin your day? Are you going to say like, oh, well, this is related and this is part of my life's destiny? Or are you going to say just a fact of life, it happens, a random thing, and, and move on, it sounds like? Right, right. Now, on the other hand, sometimes I get negative reviews that are actually very useful. You, they go into detail about how this character was poorly constructed or this was bad and so forth. You know, one review out of 40, I look at that review and I go, oh, this was actually, you know, I hate the review, of course, you know, but it was useful for the next book. And those, and they tell the reader something, you know, you, you may not like this book because this character is, say, an anti hero, and anti heroes tend to be a downer as an example that's good that's not that's what a review should be even a negative review it should tell you why they're giving the negative review and give the reader some option or some data to make a decision as to whether or not to buy the book so that's always important when looking at reviews right. especially of books is what is it tell what is it being helpful or is it just being hurtful Okay, that, that that makes a lot of sense, and I've definitely kind of been in that situation where someone said something bad, and I went and corrected it, and you know, real uploaded the book, and then replied to the comment. And I've seen some other authors do that. Uh, I don't write any fiction, but I've seen fiction authors do that, where like if somebody discovered a plot hole of some kind, if it was like something that's easily corrected, I've seen fiction authors go in and fix the book, re-upload it, reply to that comment on Amazon and say hey thanks for noticing that plot hole we fixed it and and I just that's sort of amazing to me that like it's this whole other like way of, of publishing stuff you always think about you know like if like Stephen King or James Patterson or whoever puts out a book it's like that's printed in stone but it sounds like with all this sort of Amazon stuff and the and the user feedback and the back and forth we can kind of uh, like you said like there's the course correction for the next book but there's also like fixing the current book is that correct Yes, I, I do that a lot, and usually I'll contact, if I can, the reviewer privately and sometimes publicly if I don't have a way to contact them and ask them if they can, you know, I fixed the book, can you up, update your review with uh, saying, yeah, I, he fixed it, I reread it, or um, pr publicly, like you say. Yeah, it's, it's, an, it's a great, great model for publishing. It, it's a little more interactive, and... Every, every once in a while, somebody will run across a grammar error that slips through. That always happens. And, you know, you feel embarrassed, and then you up, re-upload it. Like, 20 minutes later, you fixed it. And you couldn't do that before. Not with a year-long publication cycle in the traditional publishing houses. And they're printed. you got 50,000 of them in a warehouse. You can't reprint them. <laughs> Right, and, and that, that sort of thing reminds me of like back in back with like college textbooks, there would be like, you know, blah, 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 textbook for biology, eighth edition, and then the whole like first section would be like, oh, here's all the, the errors we made last edition, we're going to correct them, and then it's like you're never quite uh, error free of that of that book, and, it's, and so it's great how that sort of thing can sort of become a, a thing in the past, fix an error real quick, put it back up digitally, all good. And so, and you mentioned, uh, so you have this sort of, uh, this latest book of yours, this How to Make a Living uh, by Being an Author. So can you kind of tell us, like, uh, where to find that book and what that book's all about? Well, the title is How to Make a Living as a Professional Self-Published Author. It's on Amazon. Um, if you go to mybook.to slash author, you'll go straight there. Uh S E L F P U B author. And it's about 250 pages long. It's the first in a series of three. And it goes into all of the details that you need to know from idea to publishing the book and the beginnings of promotion of the book. It, and it's my experience in publishing all of these books and what works and what doesn't work. And things like you need to brand yourself as an author, you need to create a blog or website. Uh, how to create a mailing list and get people on it, something, all the things that authors typically 
many authors I've found typically don't do because a lot of us are authors because we're introverts. I include myself in that. I tended to be an introvert in the past. I'm really not anymore. Um, and then the second volume, which is coming, will be on how to promote your book. And the third volume is what to do when your book isn't selling. How do you fix that? And I'm still researching that because I've got a couple of books that you know, out of 63 books, there's obviously going to be a few that don't sell. Well, how do you fix that? Well, you fix the cover, you fix this, you fix that, you do this. And eventually, you know, you'd finally decide, you know what, the thing's never going to sell. <laughs> And, and that, that's sort of an interesting, I, yeah, yeah. And that's an interesting idea of like kind of going back and doing a little bit of, of that debugging and saying like, is there a way we can sort of bring this book back from the dead, or or is it a lost cause? And it sounds like a, a really great, a really great sort of resource, especially if that kind of thing is step by step. So I'm I'm really curious about your uh, your your writing process, and because I'm I'm looking a little bit in the table of contents of that making make a living as a self as a, make a living as a professional self published author. I'm kind of looking at the table of contents, and uh, so does this book. Am I right in assuming that this book covers like any sort of genre, like fiction, nonfiction, how-to stuff, all, like any sort of book anyone's looking to write? It applies to any book. I'm mostly a nonfiction author. I've just gone into the fiction world recently, so most of the concepts are based on my experience as a nonfiction author, but probably 90% of what's there would apply to a fiction author as well with some minor variations because it's a different genre and has a different audience and things like that. But I go into things like how to brand yourself as an author. That would apply definitely to a fiction author as well. How to create a website. Um, of course, I don't go into the specifics of how to use WordPress. There's tons of books on that. So I'll refer you to books and courses on how to do that. The idea is, is to give you more or less an overview, which is all you can do in 250 pages of the whole process of being a writer and making a living at it, which is something I've been able to do. And I wanted to share that with other people because I see a lot of authors struggling and they struggle because they write a book and they expect it to sell. That ain't going to happen. It just doesn't happen uh, unless they're extremely lucky or know somebody like Stephen King who they can write on the coattails. They're, they're not going to, their book's not going to sell and certainly not going to make them a living. But if you follow the steps in this book and do take some courses and take the time, you can make your book sell, but you have to do the work. And that's kind of the kind of what was annoying me about a lot of the online courses and other books and things. You, know, you can make a book in 90 days and you'll make a thousand dollars a week. Um, no, you're not going to. Sorry, <laughs> it's not going to happen. And then that sounds like you have to actually. Go ahead. Yeah, you have to actually like like follow through and do the, do the other things. And I've seen that sort of thing as well. And I've seen a lot. I've seen a lot of that from like other writers and authors. Like especially if it's their first book, I'll see people sort of like spend spend years and years just making the book, thinking that the finish line is the book's done. It's sent off. And then I'm thinking, yeah, but once the book's done, like, aren't you gonna you know send traffic? Aren't you gonna do some like media publicity? Like, what? Why is the the end? you know why is the end for you the book's finished when i'm thinking like isn't that more like step one of ten the book's finished it's probably like more like step one of a hundred actually oh, geez. you know there, there, there's there's a lot of steps in getting a book out there especially when you consider that the last statistic i heard was over six thousand books are published every single day on kindle alone and you think your book's going to get to the top when there's probably a hundred other books on the same subject published in this just this week in in popular categories, without any promotion, without any marketing, without people knowing who you are, without any influencers helping promote you, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, it ain't going to happen. It's just not going to happen. Uh, and if you follow all of the big writers, um, all of, who've done every, all of the big books that became movies and things, a lot of them got on the coattails of influencers. Uh, and a lot of them did a lot of the grunt work to get to become to become those millionaire authors. They had to go. They had to pay their dues, and that's basically like any job. If you were going to become a doctor, you wouldn't expect to go to one course on being a doctor and suddenly you can make the hundred thousand dollar salary. That's not going to happen to a doctor. Well, why would you think it's going to happen to a writer? <laughs> right, right. It's the and, same thing. Yeah, and also sort of going with that that doctor analogy. Like the other thing about that is. It's like there's a, there's a lot of not not just like work in being a doctor, but there's a lot of like trial and error, right? Like you gotta 
pass all your tests. You got to not screw up. You got to know your stuff. You got to work your way up. And, and I mean, I, I think that uh, I, I've seen this and, and I'm assuming you've seen this too, where a lot of people, they, they think that either because they like put in the hours or did the steps that there's like a guarantee that it's going to work out. And I'm thinking like, well, no, you got to like sort of try some stuff and see what's working. And like, you, you might have some good luck and, and some bad luck. And so like, as far as like uh, people getting their books out there, do you have like a, a checklist or is there like some sort of like, you know, quick stuff or low hanging fruit or like favorite things that you like to do as far as uh, promoting books and stuff like that? Well, that's going to be the subject of the second volume of the book, and I'm still researching it. But the the basic is, first of all, create your your author brand. You have to people have to trust you before they're going to buy a book from you, under normal conditions, unless they're your mom or your best friend or something that you beg to buy the book and pay them back for it later because they don't have any money, um, <laughs> which some authors do. You, you have to build your brand. You have to let people know who you are and why they should trust you. I wrote another book. It's actually one of, I just published it a couple months ago, um, Network Your Business for Prosperity. And it goes into how to network. And that's what you need to do is build a network of interested people who know, like, and trust you. And when they know, like, and trust you, that means that when you publish a book, they're going to go, I want to buy this because it's by Richard or it's by Robert. And that just means it's good, and that means if it's on a subject I like, I'm going to go buy it. And your famous science fiction authors, your fam Stephen King, I mean, if there's a Stephen King book, all of his fans are going to go buy it. Be why? Because they know, like, and trust Stephen King. They know if it's by him, it's going to be quality, and it's going to be something they like. Um, same with, the, I forget her name, the guy, the girl who did um, the wizard one. <laughs> the the books that became movies. Oh, uh, like the, the Harry, uh, J.K. Rowling? That's yeah, I mean, people know that a book by her is going to be good, and they, they they trust her to do a good book, so they're going to buy her book. They're going to watch her movies just because of her and her characters and things. So that's what that's the first step before you even begin writing your book is start building that brand, start building that trust line, start putting out chapters and things, and start putting out feelers and get to know reporters and influencers and other people who can help you and mentors and coaches. That's the most important step of all. And I'm kind of in the middle of that fight right now because uh, I'm partially a, an influencer and I'm becoming even a bigger influencer and I'm helping other people and then other people are helping me by being even higher level influencers. Like one of the things I'm planning to do, I'm hoping to do this time next year is do a TED Talk. And that's a major step. And you know, it's a big confront because you got you're talking to the whole world then, <laughs> and that puts you on stage as an influencer. You're somebody of influence. You you know, you talk to the world, and I'm doing a lot of public speaking, which is another thing authors should do. Start speaking at your library. Start speaking at the local um, Kiwanis and Rotary clubs and Toastmasters and things, and get out there and let people know you. Once they know you, they'll buy your books. Well, I, Unless you know you can't write, <laughs> but, but then if you if you can't write, then what what the heck are you doing in this uh, in this line of work, right? And so uh, so people should people should be like public speaking and reaching out to people and like like what does that sort of look like online? Like I assume it means like you know having like uh, like a blog, but does that also mean like having a like an email list and a Facebook page and a Facebook group and all that? Yeah, create a LinkedIn profile and make it good. Um, Anybody can hire me to make their profile. I do that for a living. Uh, do a Facebook page, a business page. Do a, make a blog and publish it at least once a week and publish short articles uh, daily if you can. Um, post on Facebook. And keep in mind these are not sales posts. This is extremely important. These are not buy my book posts or I've got a great book coming out post. Those tend to be tuned out. These are help for nonfiction I'll start from there these are helpful tips I, I'm writing a book on how to be a self-published author so I start post posting things to Facebook that are tips about being an author little two paragraph tips or little graphics or things like that and people see that and I'm not pushing my book I have my URL my link to my website but that's it my blogs tend to be I have one blog that's how to do SEO as an author it's 6,000 words long it's huge it's free it's out there on the internet it doesn't sell anything and the idea is is that it gave people helpful information and they start to trust me and then they start to know me and then they want to buy my books to find out more so it, it's a it's kind of a 
it's almost counterintuitive. You can't be a salesman. You have to be a marketer. And you certainly know the difference between sales and marketing and promotion and public relations. They're all different. You have to market yourself, not sell yourself. Market yourself means making yourself known to people that you're somebody who they can trust and like and whose opinion they respect. And probably respect is the key word there. They have to respect you. It works the same way in non, in fiction. I've got a lot of authors that I'll, if they publish a book, I'll go buy it. I'll go buy it. Mike Resnick is a book that if he publishes a book, an author, if he publishes a book, I'll buy it. I know it's going to be something I like. It's kind of space opera, you know, westerns in outer space. I'll, I've got a hundred of his books. I'll buy them because I know he's going to have a tale that entertains me for for a few days. And that's just the way it works. Awesome stuff. So, so it sounds like it sounds like there are these these things that a lot of sort of struggling authors don't do as far as like getting their name out there and uh, like you said like getting known and getting respect. And it sounds like as far as uh, like putting out these helpful tips is just like you know giving giving people things they can actually use and giving people helpful things and just being known to the point where they'll start to buy your stuff just based on uh, your name. And so when we kind of started talking here, um, I, at first I was like, well, this is sort of weird. He's a ghostwriter. He's a writer. He does LinkedIn stuff. But now things are starting to make sense as far as the way things connect. And, and you know, we don't have that much time left. I don't want to keep you forever, but I definitely want to move into this, this LinkedIn stuff because now this is super interesting because now I'm thinking, okay, a lot of people, they're stuck because – they're working on a book or they finished a book and they need to build this sort of this platform, this online presence in all these different ways. And, and it sounds like a, a LinkedIn profile is a really great way to do that. So can you sort of walk us through that side of things? Like uh, like what is what is LinkedIn uh, exactly and what do authors need to do? And more importantly, like what are authors missing on LinkedIn these days? Well, the thing about LinkedIn is it's a professional network. Facebook is a personal social network. It's where you talk about your family, your kids, etc. On LinkedIn, you talk about your business and you talk about your profession. So on fa on LinkedIn, an author would set up a, a LinkedIn profile, which is what you do. I set up a company page for me as an author. So I have a company that's Richard Lowe, author. And on there, I, I have, I announce my publications, my books, what's going on. And on my LinkedIn, I announce my books, put in helpful tips, tips and things like that, and it's very professional. And this is this is because I'm a nonfiction author, so a lot of the things has to do with people I'm connected to on LinkedIn. So you find people you're connected to, uh, excuse me, find people to connect to who are your audience, and connect to them on LinkedIn, and then give them articles and links and graphics and videos and other things that would be helpful to them. Note that would be helpful to them is important. Not necessarily something they're going to buy, but something that will help them. And I have found, and I go into this in my networking book a lot, that when the more you give, it kind of creates a vacuum, meaning you give, 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 and then suddenly the universe has to give back to you. It's, it's, it's karma, I guess. It creates this weird effect where things just start coming back. And if you're not giving, it doesn't happen. But if you're giving, it starts coming back. It doesn't come back necessarily from the people you're giving to. It's just like the universe goes, oh, I got to throw something back here because I, I got a gap here I need to fill. And I have that happen all the time. I'll be sitting there on my laurels doing nothing for two weeks. As far as giving concern, nothing happens. And then I'll start to give to some other authors, help them out, give them a little free consulting, free book coaching, stuff like that. And suddenly I'll be have people crawling all over the place out of the woodwork offering me jobs and to publish me and stuff like that's really weird <laughs> but that's the way it works funny how that is so, sort of counterintuitive and i think that I, i've experienced uh similar things to that and i've heard a lot of, of that as far as like you know us self-employed entrepreneurs it, it seems like when we when we work our tails off there's not a lot of result and then later later on when we're not working our tails off that those things that we did earlier on sort of pay off and it's almost like oh no like why was it when I was really doing all this stuff, it was like, I feel like I was getting nowhere. But then once I finally, all these things added up over time, when I kind of 
t took a second to take a break, then I got, you know, uh, all these amazing things happening. So I can definitely sort of relate to, uh, especially like the, the writing part and the content marketing part and the marketing part, just like doing all these things that at the time don't seem like they're a lot, but then added up over who knows how many days, weeks, months, years, then it kind of the, uh, uh, haze off. And so as far as like, like LinkedIn, uh, it's one of those sites where like, I keep going back to maybe like once or twice a month. And, uh, you know, I'm def definitely aware of like the profiles and the groups and, and, uh, connecting and all that. And then one thing that I noticed a few weeks ago was this whole, uh, ability to uh, have your own sort of blog, to publish your own sort of articles on LinkedIn. And I was sort of surprised cause like I hadn't even noticed this as a thing. And I noticed that a lot of people had sort of like, you know, 300, 500 posts on LinkedIn and it almost uh, seemed to me like it's sort of like the the new like easy articles and I, I'm, I'm not really sure about that though so can you sort of set me straight on that like these LinkedIn blogs like is this the thing that you do and is that worth doing I've done it in the past I haven't done it lately but the yes and I'm gonna start it up again it is very 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 worth doing because LinkedIn will promote those if they match certain keywords for example I wrote a 300 word article posted on LinkedIn about resumes because uh, I used to be a, a director of operations at Trader, computer operations at Trader Joe's and I used to have a lot of resumes and the next day I have 10,000 views on the thing I'm 10,000 views you know my post at that time only got like 50 60 views 10,000 views how the heck did that happen well it turns out that resume is a big keyword for at the time was a big keyword for LinkedIn and they posted it to all of the HR groups half Half, I got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of comments. Most of them were negative because they said I was full of junk because you know I didn't know anything about resumes, but I didn't care. I got all these views. Um, and a lot of the, the people who liked it, I got several hundred connections and have peop, you know made friends from all of that just from one article. I think I got over 50,000 views by the time it settled down. And you just – you find the right keywords in there and LinkedIn will publicize it to their own network and you can get a lot of traffic very fast and that's what it's good for. It, it gets you known. It gets you, it's, it gets, it's much better than just posting a link. Cool. That, that's super, LinkedIn. that's super encouraging. And, and all those comments and all that traffic just from three, uh, 300 word articles. So that sounds like that's definitely a thing that we should uh, all be pursuing and sort of, you know, as we're winding down uh, today, Mr. Richard, in all your sort of travels with like, you know, like yourself and your clients and seeing other authors, have you noticed like a number one universal mistake that all these authors make? Yeah, we've, we've already talked about it. They basically write a book and then they expect it to sell. And they don't take the time to create – first of all, they don't take the time to get trained on the promotional and marketing side of things. They don't hook up with an influencer or several influencers or coaches or mentors or whatever you want to call them. And they don't um, they don't create that brand for themselves. And what that means is they they don't sell their books. So, so sad stuff. So, so instead of being another statistic and just sort of hoping that things will come to you, uh, we need to be in the driver's seat. It sounds like so. Everyone out there, if you have your book, hook up with influencers, do that marketing, uh, and and you can do all that sort of cool stuff with Richard's book. So, we mentioned mybook.to forward slash self pub wealth. And are there any? I mean, I, I assume that you have like a, like a home base or an author page uh, for people to check out what you're up to in your book. So, any place like that? Any place that people should go? after listening to our talk today? There are two places they can go to. Number one is thewritingking.com. So T-H-E, writingking.com. And then the second one is coolauthor.com. And Cool Author goes directly to my Amazon page, which has all my books listed. And you'll find the self-published, how to be a self-published author there, the networking book. Uh, I also wrote a bestseller on LinkedIn, uh, how to focus on LinkedIn that sells pretty darn well right now. Making a good living off of that one. Um, awesome and, and how to sell on eBay and uh, so the LinkedIn book and the eBay book uh, so if people if I'm hearing you right if people go to coolauthor.com they'll see all your books and will they be able to easily find the LinkedIn and the eBay book if they're interested it'll be right there on the first or second page it's the, of Amazon that's my Amazon author link so that'll go straight to where all my books are listed all right great. easy to remember 
Great stuff, R right? I mean, I mean, cool author. I'd, I'd rather uh, read books from a cool author than an uncool author. So, so, so great, uh, yeah, exactly. great name, great branding there. <laughs> so, everyone, right now, go to coolauthor.com. That's c o o l a u t h o r dot com to go to Richard's Amazon page and see his books. He's a very prolific author. He has uh, top books on all kinds of fun topics. So, whatever your difficulty right now is, if it's getting the book out there, marketing the book, LinkedIn, eBay, whatever it is. Richard has the solution for you. So go to coolauthor.com to check out his books and then go to thewritingking.com to go to his website. And uh, I think you'll have a lot of fun and you'll get some of that inspiration and motivation and get some of those problems solved when it comes to either coming up with good ideas, writing your book, content marketing, promotion, whatever it is, Mr. Richard has the solution for you. So I want to thank you so much, Mr. Richard Lowe Jr. for stopping by the show and sharing some of your uh, personal stories and sharing sharing some helpful solutions and just telling us what we need to know as far as LinkedIn and book publishing and all that fun stuff. So I appreciate it. I appreciate you and thank you very much. You're welcome. It was my pleasure to be here. Subscribe to us right now while it's still fresh on your mind at robertplank.com slash iTunes or just search Robert Plank in your iTunes app.